Drive for show, putt for dough. We hear it all the time. But I want to ask you something. Is it actually true? Is that saying something that all disc golfers say in here? Is that something that all disc golfers should put into practice? Hey everybody, what is up? It's Antonio. Welcome to episode three here on Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. We have some awesome, awesome stuff planned for you. I have some awesome, awesome stuff planned for you. So I'm super excited about today's show because we're touching on a lot of different things. We're going to start with some current events earlier today. uh, Before I started recording this, there was some news about Prodigy and Gannon Burr that we're going to talk about. I'm going to follow that up with just basically talking about my disc golf game the last few weeks. I have some fun stuff I want to share with you. We're going to talk about that drive for show, putt for dough, disc golf, st- disc golf skill uh, that I previously mentioned. We're going to have a disc review of an awesome, awesome disc that I think everybody should throw at some point, if not always have it in the bag. We're going to review Waco, look to the upcoming tournament, the Open at Austin, and that'll be our show. So let's go ahead and let's get into it. Okay, so earlier today, I saw some news about Prodigy and Gannon Burr, and it's some pretty interesting stuff to say the least. So basically, Ulta World had an article, uh, Charlie Eisenhower, I believe it was, dropped an article, and I'll put the link in the description below, dropped an article about Prodigy dropping a, their request for a restraining order against Gannon Burr preliminary injunction and a hearing. So all those uh, requests were dropped, which is fairly interesting. Uh, No one really knows what's next. We had a lot of news come out a couple weeks ago. And now we've kind of just been in radio silence. There hasn't been a whole lot going on um, with this. Nothing's really been leaked. We know Gannon's been throwing Prodigy. But and, uh, we know he's been throwing Prodigy and he just won uh, the Fountain Hills Memorial uh, or whatever that term is called. I can never remember what it's called. But yeah, he just won that throwing Prodigy. So the irony there is rich. Uh, but yeah, so all of those things were dropped except the original complaint about Gannonburst contract. So that is still pending. Uh, there's there hasn't been given a date for any court hearing on that or anything uh, in regard to that. That whole thing is still pending. So I think this is going to stay behind closed doors like it has been. We haven't really heard any news um, for the last few weeks. I don't think we're going to hear a lot of stuff about this. I just think at this point, Prodigy and Gannon Burr and his mom are just trying to keep things quiet. I think both sides realized uh, pretty quickly what happened when the news got out and basically everybody was able to form their own opinions. Uh, Disc golf is big, bigger than it was three years ago, five years ago, but it's not as big as these other sports and where other things can kind of uh, sort themselves out after a couple days in sports news, things take a little bit longer in disc golf and rumors started circulating and all that other nonsense that didn't help the situation. So I think they're going to try and keep it hush hush. Now, I have some thoughts about this. I've seen other people share these similar sentiments. Let's say that everything kind of is just like, all right, the uh, the contract It's your job to fulfill it, that kind of thing. I think immediately Prodigy needs to turn around and basically say, okay, you can leave, but whoever you're going to has to buy you out. Um, I think Prodigy should accept a buyout from another sponsor if that's available, if that's an option. Uh, Quite frankly, I think they need to treat this like other sports. You don't just let your top athlete leave at the end of their contract. Um, you, you, you don't see that happen. There's only a handful of players, and the only player I can think of off the top of my head who fulfilled their contract uh, 
and never got traded or anything is LeBron James. Like when he signs a contract, he plays the extent of his contract if he intends on leaving at the end of that contract. We saw that with Cleveland the first time. We saw it with Miami. We saw it again with Cleveland. And now he's in LA and he's been there for several years now. But those fir- the first stop in Cleveland, then Miami, and then the second stop in Cleveland, he didn't leave his contract early if I remember correctly. He fulfilled it and then left. And so, but that's like a rarity. That doesn't happen a whole lot. So I really think that if Prodigy knows that there are suitors out there for Gannon Burr and that Gannon intends on leaving Prodigy at the end of this year, at the end of his contract, it would be foolish for them to not get something for it. They need to get something for him. And in this case, I mean, disc golf isn't really like trading players, but if someone's willing to buy him out, let them buy you out get that money back get compensated for that we saw mvp do that with simon and Discmania. so we know it's a thing we know it's possible that's probably what needs to happen here you can't let gannon walk and receive zero compensation uh you have to get something and you gotta crunch the numbers you gotta take gannon's disc sales and what he brought in and what the buyout is at the end of the day it might actually be worth keeping him if whatever the buyout is, is not as much as revenue he brings in. But something you have to consider is like, what is going to be the, uh, how are people going to buy Prodigy discs at the rate that they were uh, last year? Uh, And there's really no clear answer to that. Uh, I don't have the numbers of what Prodigy has been selling the last couple of weeks. I imagine they've hit a little bit of a a decline (laughs) in their sales because of everything that's happened. Now, if Prodigy can smooth things over and keep Gannon this year, I think that would do really well for their business, being able to work this out. I also think it would be hilarious. I saw someone mention this. It would be hilarious if Gannon signs an extension with them like through 2024. Um, I think that would be awesome for Prodigy. I think people will get really annoyed and frustrated with Gannon. But if anything about this whole situation, I've learned that Gannon, or I hope I should say that Gannon has learned how to do business. Obviously, there's a lot more to business than what he's experienced for the last month or so. But this is, I mean, this is experience that you really don't want to have. And hopefully from here on out, he has an agent to represent him and deal with these things. Um, Obviously, I mean, there were a lot of unknowns. The fact that he was still in high school traveling the country as a high schooler, you know, competing at an incredibly high level, winning USDGC. These are not things that Prodigy or even Gannon and his family probably predicted. They would have loved, obviously, for it to happen, and it did happen, but they didn't predict these things. And so I I hope Gannon Burr and his family have learned, like, this is not a good situation for him to find himself in professionally uh, and legally, like with contracts and everything. So hopefully he gets an agent soon. I don't know what stipulations there are for agents um, and minors, but as soon as he, if, if there's a thing with that, hopefully as soon as he turns 18, he can get an agent because that would be super helpful. And that would help him with a lot of this and be able to keep his emotions out of play. That's one of the biggest things we see in sports and the benefits of agents keeping the athlete's emotions out of it and just keeping it business. And honestly, that's basically, I looked up some Drew Gibson stuff because <laughs> we talked about last week with all the uh, um, the hoodies and all that kind of stuff. I didn't really see anything new, um, nothing really to share there. So I want to just spend a few minutes and share with you guys some stuff that I've been dealing with in a good way uh, with disc golf. I got to say the month of March has probably been uh, some of the most fun disc golf that I have played in a long, long time. Uh, obviously, Teach Play Disc Golf is brand new. There's that excitement. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. But actually playing disc golf has been so much fun. And I just want to be open and honest about this. I really think it's because I'm not stressing about creating uh, tutorials and videos of that kind. I'm creating content still. But the format is different. It's simpler, honestly, for me. And it's just helped me, one, enjoy my life more. 
uh, appreciate my time with my family, have more time to spend with my family. But also going and playing disc golf is so enjoyable. I used to only be able to get out once, maybe twice a week and feel like I had to record either you know, with the, DS, uh, with the DSLR or with my phone and record throws. And today I went and played and I brought my tripod with me in the car, but I decided to leave it because I looked around and the, and the course was pretty busy. And I didn't know just how many times I was gonna get to throw some second shots and really like film. In retrospect, I could have, but at the same time, I really enjoyed not worrying about it. I just got to play and disc golf has been so much fun. Um, it's, it's a, uh, I'm reminded from the last couple of weeks this month, like just how much I love this game and why I honestly fell in love with it in the beginning, because I'm just able to get out and throw plastic and work on my game and just see such growth in my game. It's it's crazy how much my backhand has improved just in 2023, but let alone uh, since I moved to Tennessee. Yeah, I think I've talked about this before on the show where like moving here, something clicked for me. I think the change of scenery just gave me uh, a fresh start and that has really helped and it has been awesome just playing. So I've really enjoyed it. Today I went to uh, Crockett Park. I know most people who are listening to this have no idea the courses I'm talking about. I will say I do share a lot of video from these courses that I do mention. So you'll get to be familiar with some of them, like in YouTube shorts and Instagram reels. But I was at a I was at Crockett Park earlier today and I shot a pretty good score. I was pretty happy with it. I did throw some second shots and honestly, I even counted some of those second shots as throws for my score. So yeah, my score is a little inflated by maybe one or two strokes. But you know what? I had so much fun and I was working on things and I was trying to reflect uh, the progress and it was just a blast. Uh, you know, like I mentioned before, I played like 95% solo rounds and I'm okay with that. It doesn't bother me, but I was so happy to be out there. I was slinging some mockingbirds. I was throwing the comet, uh, which is a disc, which is the disc that we're going to review today. And so we'll get to that in a little bit, but oh man, I've just, I'm just loving my bag and how it's coming along this year and just a lot of really, really cool things. So I'm having a lot of fun playing disc golf this, uh, late winter, early spring, and I hope you are too. Um, I want to hear about your disc golf journeys. I wanna hear your progress. I wanna hear your excitement. So feel free to leave a review on this episode or uh, message me on Instagram. Like, Let me know how your disc golf journey is going. I wanna hear about it. It's so much fun and it's so exciting to hear from you, uh, to just know that you love this game as much as I do and your uh, progress with it. So let me know about that. Okay, so we hear drive for show, putt for dough. And I just gotta ask, is this saying true? Drive for show, putt for dough. Is it actually true? Yes, putting is where you make your money, so to speak. Putting is where you really improve and get better. But at the same time, it's not entirely true. Let's figure out what the heck I'm talking about. So I want to use the FPO field as an example uh, because there's a little bit more disparity in skill level in the FPO field than there is in the MPO field. And truthfully, most players most disc golfers, I should say, whether male or female, most disc golfers are closer in skill level to FPO players than they are to the MPO players. So let's consider some of the players in the FPO field, some of the golfers. We have Evelina, and I want you to, as I'm, as I'm saying these names, think about these players' skills, their strengths, right? Evelina, uh, Evelina Solonen, Hannah Blomrus, Kat Mersch, Haley King, Kona Montgomery. That's good. I got to get used to saying I was at Kona Panis. Kona Montgomery. What do all of those players have in common? All of them are incredible at throwing the disc. Every single one of them can bomb the disc. Uh, some of these ladies are throwing the disc 450, 500 feet. They are absolutely crushing. Throwing further than most disc golfers, 
right? But that is all their strength. What is their weaknesses? And they all have varying levels of weakness with this, but they all struggle with putting. Like, I would say of those five ladies I mentioned, Kona, Henna, and Evelina struggle the most. But I've seen rounds where Haley King and Kat Merch can't really putt. Like, like they're, they're driving pretty well, they're approaching pretty well, but they're just not making their putts. They're just off. They're not consistently good putters. So, you know, Kat and uh, Haley King may not are not the worst putters on tour. Uh, they're not even necessarily bad putters, but they're not exceptionally great putters. So now think about these next three women I'm going to name some of their strengths. Kristen Tatar. Own Scoggins, Katrina Allen. All of them throw really, really far. Well, except Own, and we'll talk about her here in a second. But they throw pretty far, especially Tatar and Kat. They also have been putting really consistently, especially Katrina Allen. I mean, I remember watching rounds where Katrina Allen was missing 10 foot putts. You know, she was um, the most popular player to have the putting yips she figured it out right Tatar seems to always be really good at putting even if she has a span of a couple holes where she's just not locked in on the putting green she figures it out own one of her strengths is putting but more than that she's always consistent she doesn't make a lot of mistakes all of these players play consistently especially for the last year year and a half so I want to ask you guys now, as you're as you're listening to this, of these two groups, the first group we had Evelina Solonen, Hanna Blomrups, Kat Mersch, Haley King, Kona Montgomery. Second group, Kristen Tatar, Owen Scoggins, Katrina Allen. We're talking about drive for show, putt for dough. Which of these two groups wins more? Which of these two groups is on the podium more? Group two, Kristen Tatar. Own Scoggins, Katrina Allen. Obviously, the three of them are better putters than the group one ladies overall. So putting is a huge advantage and can help you score better than your competitors, especially when it matters. But I want to argue something here because I said, yes, drive for show, putt for dough. Like, yes, it's true, but there's also something about it that's not true. It's helpfulness only goes so far. Putting's helpfulness only goes so far. And remember I mentioned that we talk about Own Scoggins, and that's what I want to bring up. Own is an awesome player, a great player. She plays so smart, she is consistent. She doesn't make a lot of mistakes. She lacks power. She's not a big bomber. And, you know, three, five, 20 years ago, did it matter in the FPO field if you had a lot of power or not? I mean, even now, if you can put 70, 80% in the FPO field, you will probably finish like top five, top 10 in every event, minimum. You might even win some, okay? But the thing is, when you look at the field and how it's growing and how we have young women like Caroline Henderson who are throwing just as far, if not further than own Scoggins already and is working on the approach game and the putting and that just comes with more experience and high pressure situations. The FPO field is growing at a ridiculous rate and is getting some amazing athletes. Think about the, the group one ladies, Evelina, Henna, Kona, uh, Kat Merch, Haley King, all young players. Think about what would happen if you take all of those women and turn them into 80, 85% C1X putters. Does Own even win? Let alone, does Own even make podium? Is it even possible that if that all happens, if the FPO field continues to grow and improve, you have you eventually have a, a, a time in the FPO field where distance matters where power off the tee and driving capabilities matter. 
And so I think that the FPO field is gearing up for sort of a, a crossing point where as a uh, as a collective, the women almost need to like decide is driving going to matter or is only putting going to matter. And I'm telling you right now, my opinion, it looks like p- driving is going to matter. We're reaching a point where so many women are throwing so far that putting helps, but you have to be able to drive. Now, don't get me wrong. Putting will always be important. It doesn't matter how far you can throw. You still have to be able to make your putt. And, you know, that's where you can make up a lot of strokes on the field if you're a consistent putter. You know, if there's a a tough 350 foot hole and you play for the three every time, you get the three every time. And the people who play for two either get a birdie or a bogey, you're gaining strokes on the field. Now you're losing strokes to some people. But probably for the majority, if it's that tough of a 350 foot hole that people are bogeying it pretty regularly and you can play smart and get the three, that works in your favor, you know, but there's going to, there's coming a time and I think we're going to see it more and more this season where players, especially women in the FPO field, If they can continue to throw further and work on that putting, they're going to be placing a lot higher. So bringing it back to us now. Drive for show, putt for dough is fun to say and laugh about. And while there is some truth in it, at the end of the day, what do we notice about the winners and the best players on tour, MPO and FPO? The winners and the best players have complete games. They drive well, they approach well, and they putt really, really well. Their weaknesses that weekend are minimal, if if they even have any weaknesses in their game entirely. But sometimes you have someone have a really good weekend and they win, even if they can't do that again and on repeat every weekend. But you can put they can put it together for that one weekend and win. Minimal weaknesses, they play to their strengths. And the cards, the chips just kind of fall their way. So I say all that because I want to encourage you to keep working on putting. And I want to encourage you to keep working on your driving and your approaching. But most importantly, look at your disc golf game and your skill holistically as something that every time you work on a new skill, it's going to affect other aspects of your game. If you work on your driving and you start getting further and further down the fairway, you start hitting your lines more consistently, guess what? You're building confidence and momentum to when you get on the putting green, you're like, I just drove down this fairway. Now let's smash this putt in the chains and you're confident about it. So you're more than likely going to make the putt. Versus if when you were hardly getting off the tee, you were scrambling to save par and then you still had a 20 foot putt to make and you're like, if I miss this, I'm screwed. It's going to be a bogey on a 300 foot hole that's like just straight ahead, nothing crazy. And it's discouraging. And on the flip side, if you struggle with putting, if you start working on your putting and working on your putting, constantly getting better, using tools like the champ cap, and working on your accuracy and your focus, all of a sudden that's gonna give you more more confidence, but also being way more relaxed on the tee. And if there's anything I've learned about teeing off and throwing drives, you throw better when you're relaxed. When you're amped up and stressed about your drive, you're not gonna throw well. So if you have supreme confidence on the putting green, it helps you relax on your drive, which is then going to help you throw better off the tee. And when you continue to throw better off the tee, it's going to continue to grow your confidence on the putting green because you're going to feel really good about your game. And so that's what I'm talking about here. This holistic approach to your putting to your disc golf game. Yes, you need to work on individual things. But don't get so stressed out about individual pieces that you lose the big picture of how everything is working together here and how it's going to make you a better disc golfer overall. So I hope that makes sense. Um, That's something that had been on my mind and I just wanted to share and I hope it makes sense. I hope it encourages you to uh, work through some of the frustrations you may be feeling and to just know that some days are going to be rough. Other days 
are going to be great. I heard an audio on Instagram a couple weeks ago. I've been wanting to make a video with this audio from Instagram, and I just haven't done it yet. But it's an Olympian talking about her Olympic coach telling her the law of thirds. And basically, you know, because she was saying like, ah, oh, practice today wasn't that great, or I didn't feel good. And, and her coach said, the law of thirds is this, and I'm paraphrasing here and, I, and everything, but you'll never be 100% perfect every day. You'll never do everything right every single time. So when you're training, <clears throat> when you're practicing, when you're training and when you're practicing, a third of the time, it's going to be great. Everything's going to be awesome. A third of the time, it's going to be the worst day ever. Nothing's going to click. Timing is going to feel off. Your putts aren't going to fall. Your drives are going to hit every first available tree. You're going to look more like a lumberjack out on the course than you are a disc golfer. But then the other third is like, most things are clicking, but maybe your drives are a little off this day, or your putts are a little off, or your approaches are a little shaky. And the thing is, that's how you get good. That is how Olympians and the best disc golfers improve. If you only have bad days, you'll lose motivation to get better. If you only have great days, you won't learn how to overcome adversity and to deal with challenges in disc golf. So the law of thirds is this powerful idea that applies to everything we've talked to. And so when you have a bad day, just tell yourself, Oh, this is the third, you know, this is one of my thirds. It's just a bad day. You could play three days in a row and have three different results for those days. And it's going to be subjective for each person. Someone's great day would probably be an MPO player's bad day. But that same person's great uh, bad day might be a 750, 800 rated disc golfer's greatest day. So it's all subjective to you and to your disc golf skill, but use that to motivate you as you're working on your driving and your putting. Think about the law of thirds. Okay, let's go ahead and let's get into our disc review. This disc review is brought to you by OTB Discs. OTB Discs was my very first sponsor and it's been an honor to work with them now for over two years. Uh, over two years, nearly two years, yeah, over two years, 2020, I think. Uh, yeah, November 2020, October 2020 um, was when I started. So we're coming up to three years and it has been awesome working with them. So this disc review is brought to you by OTB Discs. You can get today's disc at otbdiscs.com and use discount code GLADIATORDG for free shipping. And when you buy enough discs, that free shipping really adds up and you can end up getting another disc with what would have cost you to ship everything. So it's an awesome, awesome code, GLADIATORDG for free shipping. Let's go ahead and let's talk about the Discraft Comet. Last episode, we talked about the Mint Bobcat, and I was full on ready to talk about the Mint Bullet this episode, but I said I probably shouldn't do Mint Discs back to back. Let's go ahead and let's talk about another disc that I love and recently has made its way back into my bag. I uh, traded for a couple of them and just fell back in love with this disc. The Discraft Comet is a slow, neutral to understable mid-range. It's four speed, five glide, minus two turn, and one fade. Discraft makes the Comet in a variety of plastics and you have some uh, signature series Comets out there as well. The thing that I love about the Comet first and foremost is that as someone who came from an Ultimate Frisbee background, the Comet's large diameter and, it, and the dome kind of makes it feel a little uh, deeper than it even really is. And it's, it's obviously not a Frisbee, but as an ultimate player, it feels uh, pretty comfortable and, con you know, a disc golf type Frisbee, if that makes sense. It's a large diameter. It's got a nice dome. Um, it's a really good disc for people who are transitioning from ultimate to disc golf. So if that's you, try out a Discraft Comet. But the Comet is just such a versatile disc. Now, like I said, it is neutral to understable depending on the run and the plastic. 
all of them will beat in to be super flippy if you throw it long enough. It is because of that, it is so good for all skill levels. It's a four speed disc, which means it doesn't take a lot of power and honestly skill to throw. It will fly nice and straight. And if you're brand new or don't have good form, it will have a little bit of fade on it, but it's gonna be controllable. But it's also understable enough to fly nice and straight. So for the beginner, it's going to really teach you great form and help you dial in your nose angle while still being forgiving. For the more intermediate, advanced, and professional level players, this is a great versatile, neutral to understable mid-range that's going to give you beautiful hyzer flips, panning and hyzers, and just really great control in the woods. One of the most popular players to throw the Comet is Michael Johansson. Think, if, if you don't know who that is, think about James Conrad, make him a little bit shorter and about 20 years older. Long hair and everything. Michael Johansson, I believe he lives in North Carolina. Woods master, so good. He throws a lot of thrashers and a lot of comets. Um, so, 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 so good with the Comet. He has a signature series Comet and he just shreds with that disc. The Comet is great for hitting your lines and navigating through the woods, but because of its glide, five glide, it is also great for open courses. I love, I have loved throwing the Comet on some open holes and just watching it fly. Like it is just awesome to look at. Uh, and just see as it turns a little bit, stables up, and then finishes nice and flat. The Comet, the ones that I have, it, it's not a turnover machine right now, so I don't worry about turning and burning. Uh, obviously, if I threw it in a headwind, it would definitely do that. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the, the Comet does not have high-speed stability. It will turn if you throw it really hard and get it over that sort of four or five speed threshold, which is okay because sometimes you want that, you know, like hyzer flip to turn kind of thing, depending on what you're doing, or you really need a sharp jackknife turn. Um, but you do not want to throw the Comet in a headwind overall. You, at the point of throwing a Comet is not to really turn it over crazy into a roller. You don't really throw Comets for rollers. At least I never really see people doing that very often. Um, the point of the Comet is to glide down the fairway to take advantage of its glide, of its straight flight, and of its consistency that you get with it when you throw. Throwing it in a headwind will ruin that for you. Also, this disc, the, the, the hand feel is a little strange. It's going to take some getting used to. If you've thrown a, uh, a rock, an end of a rock, it's a kind of like the rock and hand feel, still a little different, but kind of like it. It's not as smooth as something like uh, the Discraft Meteor or the Soul. Those are even flippier uh, based on flight numbers out of the box, but the Comet is better than those in my opinion because it's not too flippy that it's hard to control. You can really get a nice consistent flight out of it. But here's one of the biggest detriments to the Comet. It is gross to forehand. <laughs> it does not feel good throwing the Comet on a forehand for a couple reasons. The dome, the nose of the disc just feels weird, kind of in that, uh, in the webbing between your index finger and your thumb. It just feels weird. It doesn't come off the hand super clean. You can physically forehand the Comet, but I would not recommend it. But overall, I strongly recommend the Comet just as a disc to throw. I like it a lot. I threw it a bunch today when I was at Crockett Park and I had a lot of fun watching it fly. I haven't thrown one in a while, so I'm still, I'm like having to relearn how to throw the Comet. But when I have a good throw with it, I'm just like, man, why did this disc ever come out of my bag? And I don't know why, but it did and it's back. And we'll see how long it stays in the bag. But this disc is great for all skill levels. I strongly recommend it. It comes in so many different plastics. Talk with people you know who uh, throw the Comet. They can give you some insight into some plastics um, and different runs. Because there are some like Z runs that were flippier than, than it's kind of supposed to be. And then there are more like 
neutral runs like it's supposed to be. And then you have the Michael Johansson ones that I think are a touch more stable. So it might be more like minus one turn, but obviously as you season that, it'll start to turn for you a little bit more. But that's the disc brought to you by OTB Discs. If you wanna check out a comment, go ahead and head to otbdiscs.com. Use discount code GladiatorDG for free shipping. All right, let's go over Waco. And I have one word for Waco, wild. That was some of the best tournament golf that I have watched in a long, long time. The coverage was great for the most part. The coverage was great. And the competition was incredible. Both MPO and FPO really start really came down to the wire to the last, you know, last one or two holes in different scenarios. It was just so much fun to watch. The the energy was there. And what's great is that I think this was only the second uh, elite series on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. And so the fact that the competition is already this hot. It, it's just so exciting for what uh, we can expect the rest of the year. The MPO field, we'll start with MPO, was very, very, very close to the very end. In the end, Kyle Klein pulled through with the win from the chase card with a minus 13 final round, which is just absolutely bonkers. Like when you think about Paul McBeth throwing minus 18 several years ago, there were some soft par fives. I'm not saying that the minus 13 is comparable to the minus 18 because minus 18, regardless of the par, is still incredible because nobody else did it. It wasn't that easy to do. But minus 13, I would say, was probably close to like a minus 15 or 16 on that layout where Paul threw minus 18. So what he did at minus 13 is absolutely wild. It was so close going into the final round. You had so many players in contention, and we'll get to scores in, here in a little bit. But you had so many players who were in the running and could potentially win Waco, uh, which is just awesome. That's what you want going into the final round. You don't want uh, a, a final round uh, of a tournament to basically be a blowout. You want at least two, three, four players in the hunt. It just makes it way, way more exciting. In all of that excitement, though, I got pretty annoyed at the very end. Kyle Klein uh, birdies hole, t uh, hole 18. Birdies hole 18. Finishes at minus 31 under. Adam Hammes it was the leader going into the final round. He needed to, I believe he needed to birdie hole 17 he didn't. So then Kyle basically had a uh, a one stroke or two stroke lead. I'm forgetting the numbers now off the top of my head. But ultimately, Adam Hammes going into hole 18 needed to ace it. He needed to ace it to tie. So he was two strokes down. Now, this is a 400 foot hole. Adam Hammes definitely has enough power to do that. I was so like, oh word is this going to happen is like adam has power he has accuracy he has control and then he's on the t-pad and he's getting ready to throw and then the coverage blacks out i lost all excitement because i didn't get to see adam hammes's tee shot on hole 18 because the disc golf network's coverage blacked out and I know some people said like, oh, but they replayed it afterwards. I'm like, but but it's not live. Even in the commentary, commentator's voice and how they're covering the replay, you can tell it doesn't go in. You can tell he doesn't tie to push a playoff. And it was just so dis like frustrating to, to have that happen because it was like, oh, I wanted to see it happen. And even though it didn't happen, not seeing it, not happen was just like well i didn't even finish watching the hole I, I was just like well i know kyle klein wins now and so i turned it off and so that was annoying maybe maybe i'm just being a little grumpy about that it's definitely possible but i was just annoyed about that uh the beast overall it it beat some people up when you look at the scores um you had a lot more MPO players shooting over par on the weekend than I think we'll have close to um, 
like probably more than any other course, maybe Idlewild, especially given the conditions at Idlewild, it might have uh, more players shooting over par there, but there were a lot of players shooting over par. They didn't cash, um, but just way more than I was expecting. And then you have FPO and I love that FPO was just as wild of a finish, was just as hotly contested and competitive throughout the entire weekend. This was the first tournament that Kristen Tatar played this season in the States. She just came over from Estonia. Waco was her first tournament of the season in in the States on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Which, just thinking about that, like, you didn't come early and play like an easy A tier or something to kind of get in the groove of things. You came to America, you showed up at the Beast, and then you won. (laughs) Like, can we just think about that for a second and just appreciate how good she is? Like, it is absolutely insane. And as excited as I am for Kristen and happy for her, I I, I, I would have been so happy for Ella Hansen if she if she pulled it out and won. She had a three or four stroke lead going into hole 15 and she lost by one. She just completely melted down and collapsed. I remember, I think, um, who was it? Uh, uh, Valerie uh, on the commentating with Terry Miller. Terry Miller, Valerie Doss was basically, I think she was saying that uh, Ella has never won an event, not not just like a disc golf pro tour event, but like ever won an event. And so this, she was on the brink of winning her first event, and that just shows you how hard it is to win your first event, to win your first title, to win your first world championship, your first USDGC, your first anything is so hard to do. Because you don't know how to do it yet. And I know that's like, well, yeah, that's that's why it's hard because you don't know how to do it. But like winning requires something different than just playing well. And Ella played really, really well. But she hasn't quite learned how to win yet. And there are a couple things that you could point to that she went OB on hole 16 when it was like, like if she had not gone OB on hole 16, she probably would have been fine. And then she went OB on hole 16. Then she went on OB on hole, uh, hole. She went OB on hole 17 as well. Then she went on OB on hole 18 as well. And so just a lot of mistakes driving off the tee. And that's why, you know, a lot of our conversation earlier in the show was talking about like, yeah, putting for dough is important, but guess what? Ella lost money because she couldn't drive. So driving isn't just for show. Driving's also to make your dough. It's important to be able to drive and get off the tee. It's important to be able to approach the basket cleanly. Because if you don't, you're going to suffer the consequences of that. Because if you can't get off the tee, you put all that pressure on your putt. And that's what was happening to Ella. She wasn't getting off the tee. Everything was stressful. She couldn't relax. And not that she needed to coast because uh, Kristen was charging, but it's really hard to make up four strokes in four holes when you're the person who's trying to make those strokes up. Because all it takes is for you to have one mistake, or even if Ella played three of the four holes poorly and gave up three strokes, she still had four stroke lead. She still would have won by one. And so it's just like Kristen did everything in her power to stay in it. And then she just continued. She had the momentum and she had no stress. The stress was not on her whatsoever because it was all on Ella given the situation, given the context. So it's unfortunate for Ella that she didn't win. It's unfortunate that it ended the way she did. And I'm, But I am so grateful for two things. One, that she had that support system around her. I don't know if you've seen the picture floating around social media, but some of her closest friends embraced her in a hug. And I thought that was really sweet and kind and just supportive knowing what it what winning would have meant to Ella, but then also just knowing that these players are forming some amazing relationships on tour. So it's just great to see that. But I also hope that she learned something 
from this that she is now hungrier than ever to get back out on the course and to win and that she now has an inkling of what it requires and in a sense it's almost it's it's not as hard as she maybe thought it was like winning is hard yes but being as close as she was to winning she probably realized i i had it i was doing that i was getting off the tee cleanly my putting was good and even when it was shaky in the final round at times my putting my driving was still so good and consistent up until up until hole 15 and 16 it was so good and consistent that it kept me in the lead so she's right there and i really 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 hope that she gets it gets her first win disc golf pro tour win and just a win in general that would be awesome now a name that i haven't mentioned um at all on the show yet this is the third episode haven't talked about this fpo player at all and if i was doing this show in the second half of last year i also probably wouldn't have talked about her a whole lot Paige pierce finished tied for 16th at even what is going on with Paige pierce now this is not just me like just being obnoxious and just like saying, oh yeah, she's been fine, but I'm just picking on her for this one event. No, she's not even finishing close. This event, she finished tied for 16th. If you go back to last year and you look at her 2022 schedule, Paige was on fire. She did so well. She started off great, but she hasn't won an event since July of last year. Now, I'm a firm believer that you have to judge your superstars, your potential goats, if you will. You have to judge them differently. There are a lot of players who haven't won an event since July of last year. A lot of players. More players haven't won than players have won, all right? But when you're Paige Pierce, five-time world champion, as good as she is to not have won an event and what, what's basically like July is the seventh month. Okay, we're in March. So you're looking at eight months, right? Hasn't won an event in eight months. Someone who's won five world titles. That doesn't happen a lot. And so I'm really interested what's going on with her. In the last 11 events, because I looked at her schedule, she's only finished on the podium four times. She's four for 11 on the podium. So she went from not only winning, but hardly even being on the podium. And what, what to contrast this even more, before July, she finished on the podium 10 out of 16 events. Seven of those 10 podium finishes were victories. So she had seven victories in 16 events with 10 podium finishes. Fast forward or start in July now, of the last 11 events, she's only been on the podium four times. We haven't heard anything from her camp, from her support. Um, She hasn't, as far as I've heard, really talked about it. I know in one of the disc golf uh, biographies on the the disc golf network, she, she talks a little bit about that in one of the episodes. But... That's that was like filmed last year and it's still happening now. And so it's just very interesting why she's struggling. And I don't and it's almost hard to even just like process and come up with a reason why it might be happening because she we know she has the skills. So it's almost like is she too distracted in her personal life? Is she lacking the confidence and the mental headspace to perform well? Those are all possible things. And we don't really know, haven't really shared anything, but I just wanted to point that out. Like, it's it's kind of weird. Paige Pierce is not playing very well. Um, and if you consider what the rest of the FPO field is doing, it's it would be better with Paige Pierce doing well. But man, it's been pretty exciting regardless. It's been really exciting. And so it'll be really cool to uh, have her improve, hopefully get her back in contention 
because I think then that's just going to elevate the FPO field even more when Paige Pierce is coming back. And then the, those group one women I talked about, Evelina, Henna, Kona, if they can all find their putts, start competing. Now you all of a sudden you have a, a cluster of five or ten women who are so good and all of them could potentially win every weekend. That would be awesome. So let's go ahead and let's wrap this up, talking about this section up, talking about the results, and we will go through this uh, pretty quickly. MPO, oh, I messed it up. Let me pull that back up. <laughs> so MPO, we had Kyle Klein winning at minus 31, Adam Hammes, second, minus 29, uh, tie for third with Cole Rodolin and Calvin Cole Rodolin and Calvin Heimberg at minus 28. Don't know why I couldn't say his name there. Kevin Jones in fifth at minus 27. James Conrad sixth, minus 26. Uh, tie for seventh with Kale Leviska or Leviska. Matt, Matty O at minus 25. Uh, both of those tied for seventh. Ninth place, Nate Sexton, minus 24. And then a tie at 10th with Joel Freeman, Bradley Williams, and James Proctor shooting minus 23. So nine strokes between the top uh, top 10 places. Let's go ahead. And then what's interesting is Paul was on the lead card, Paul Macbeth. He finished 13, tied for 13 at minus 22. Paul did not have a great final round. Um, but that's what happens uh, sometimes. Now, there were... Uh, there weren't as many over par. You know, I looked at it earlier and it looked like there were a lot more. There weren't nearly as many over par players, but still more than I would have anticipated. All right, let's go to FPO really quick. First place, Kristen Tatar, minus 14. Ella Hansen, second place, minus 13. Owen Scoggins, minus 10. In third place, Sarah Hokum in fourth at minus 9. Tie for fifth, Haley King, Anna Kastan, Deanne Carey at minus 8. Paige Shu, Kat Mersch, Tied for eighth at minus six, and Katrina Allen solo tenth at minus five. So really good showing, about nine strokes there separating the top ten places. So that's pretty cool. MPO and FPO only had nine strokes separating the top ten players. So really, really good competition. I love Waco. It's one of my favorite events of the year, if not my favorite. Um, I just always, always enjoy it. Alrighty, everybody. Well, that is all I have for today's episode, episode three. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. I hope you found some encouragement when we talked about driving for show, putting for dough, and, and even connecting it to what we saw in Waco. I hope you found it encouraging and helpful. There are a few things I want to remind you here at Teach Play Disc Golf, and that's to go ahead and teach someone disc golf this week, whether that's giving them an encouraging message on social media or teaching someone out at the course, help someone improve this week. Definitely go play disc golf and have fun, and I want to hear how it's going for you. I, I, I want to know what your disc golf journey is like. That's all I have for you today, everyone. Until next time, have a great round.